artistic director of New Dramatists. I'm Emily Morris. I'm the director of artistic development. And I'm John Stieber. I am the director of the Playwrights Lab. <coughs> I'm Eddie Sanchez, the former member. You want to tell, tell us your names? Yeah. I'm Carlos Turrell. I'm a playwright, and uh, I am uh, very much involved in a group called Around the Walk, which is dedicated to cultivating theater in the communities of New York City. Okay. I'm a playwright, screenwriter, the Queens, used to work sitting in I'm Robert Brown. I thought of myself as a musician for many, many years, but in the past few years, uh, playwriting has kind of consumed me. <laughs> <laughs> right. right? Yeah. Uh, John Russo, I'm an actor and writer. David Levine, playwright. I'm Stinger C. Playwright. Now, uh, who is playwright? Retired arts of the spirit. All right. Yeah. I'm Edmund Miller. I've been a poet for a long, long time, but I just started writing plays a few years ago. Great. Thanks. Uh, Chris Phillips, Claire. Sean Welch. Thanks, Sean. And it's Brian. Brian, it's on your own, Claire. Okay, and you just. Hi, I'm Juliana. I'm actually an actress. Okay. Oh, great. Thanks. So these guys over here, you want to introduce yourselves and say what you're doing so we know why you look so serious? And sure. Yeah. It's much more impressive than I <laughs> said, Robert, you. So I'm Morgan Allen. I'm the director of finance and new media. So we're live streaming this uh, meeting for folks that couldn't be here, and we're also recording it. So if all goes according to plan, you'll be able to watch this later on our website, should you want to. <laughs> I'm Penny Valor. I'm a new dramatist intern. I'll be fielding some questions from Twitter today. I'm Kathy, I'm going to drop this in Great, thank you guys. So, um, uh, for the last four or five years, we've been doing these town halls annually um, to take questions mostly and lay out what the admissions process is at New Dramatists, a little bit about New Dramatists. Um, New Dramatists, uh, I'll start by talking a little bit about the place. Um, it's important to know that New Dramatists is 64 years old, and for almost that entire time, the admissions process has been shrouded in mystery. Um, and it seems particularly mysterious to the people who apply year after year. And so um, some of you have never applied before, some of you have applied before, some of you, like Brian, has been a Van Leer fellow with us, has been involved here. Um, Caroline just came in. You wanted to say your name, and um, Caroline Crew. All right. Um, so thank you. So we uh, so we started doing this as a way of unshrouding a, a little bit and to clarify what's going on, and then also over um, every year we we're refining the process or the access to the process in different ways. So we want to make sure that everybody's getting the information. So this is why we're taking advantage of the live streaming. This is why uh, we've been doing this in early July before our admissions window opens. Um, because the last thing that we want in the world is for playwrights to feel that this place is mysterious or impenetrable. It's the exact opposite of what we're here to do, which is to help sustain playwrights make lives in this difficult you know, field that you've chosen. Um, New Dramatist, uh, as I said, is 64 years old. It started as a way of playwrights getting together, uh, reading work to each other, gaining access to what was then the only way for a playwright to work, which was really the Broadway theater. The times have changed. We have a whole different ecosystem of theater in America now. Um, and we try to stay connected to uh, all of what we may mean by theater, uh, nonprofit, for profit. Um, uh, professional, uh, experimental. Uh, our, uh, our program is based around a seven-year residency for, for playwrights, which is a free residency. Um, we're in an 
old church in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, we have a couple of workshop spaces, this being the smaller of the two. We have writing studio space. We have a library of uh, current manuscripts by our writers and uh, many plays by our alumni writers. We have residence rooms upstairs for writers from out of town. Um, all of the services of New Dramatists are free to our uh, resident playwrights for their seven years here, at which point they rotate into alumnihood like Eddie. Um, and uh, you know, did you call yourself an old player? You used to be a yeah, former, former, former New Dramatist. That's it. Yes, we have, we've never found the exact language, but yes, alumnihood. Um, so this is the, the thing that we offer. We offer, uh, and at the heart of it is the, uh, is, is the company of other playwrights. So this place is founded on the premise that you as writers are each other's greatest resources, that, um, and that uh, signifies a level of engagement with the community of writers while you're here. Um, uh, it's, it suggests that this is not a place uh, to go just for a thing to put on your resume, uh, though it does really exist as a place to develop work and develop work over a, a long period of time, seven years. But what it really is, it's a community of writers, and those writers have activities, and they have um, uh, a wisdom for each other, and they have engagement in each other's work, and that's what we as a staff always hope to foster. Um, the staff, uh, there's a staff of nine people, we, uh, the core of our programming has to do with the laboratory in which the playwrights develop their work through readings and extended workshops, through some professional development opportunities, um, through some exchanges, some retreats, all kinds of programs for playwrights. And then the central part of that is the sense of a creative home for seven years and the sense of a, of a booing uh, creative community during that time, and we hope beyond as well. Um, so that's something that the staff tries to foster. Um, uh, just in terms of uh, numbers and access, uh, and Emily will talk more about the process in a minute, uh, it is a very um, uh, small funnel to pass through to get into New Dramatists, which is not really about exclusivity, it's about um, uh, resources. So we, at any one time, um, serve 50 playwrights. I think currently we have 49 resident playwrights. With a staff of nine and two active theater spaces and uh, limited money because we sell nothing, charge no dues or anything, um, that's really what we can maintain. Can't, you know, if we could provide a world of services to a world of playwrights, we would certainly do that. Uh, and I suspect 600 to 700 playwrights have passed through here in 64 years. But last year we had over 500 playwrights apply. We were able to uh, come to consensus on our admissions panel, which and we will talk about also, um, around seven, mm -hmm. right, seven. this year. So you're looking at numbers that are about, you know, a little more than 1% of the people who apply in any given year get in, and every year is very different in terms of what the panel is looking for because it's always an entirely different panel. The other thing I'd like to say at the top before I turn over to Emily and, and the rest of the uh, us guys and then open to your questions is that... Um, one of the great misunderstandings about New Dramatists, and one of the great mysteries that it's been shrouded in all these years, is that there is a kind of New Dramatist monitor, that it's a, it's a gatekeeper organization, the way that a literary management office might be a gatekeeper for a theater. And therefore, you know, it's like, oh, New Dramatist rejected me again this year, or New Dramatist doesn't like my work, or New Dramatist loves me, or any, any of those station statements are inevitably false because there is no consistent presence on the admissions panel. Those of us who are on staff have no say in who gets in here, and we don't participate on a level of opinion or feedback with the, um, 
with the admissions committee each year. We run the process, we facilitate the meetings, we keep our mouths shut. So every year is a new year, and it is a little bit like the lottery or something where every year your odds are exactly the same. You're starting over again um, with a blank slate because the people who are on the panel didn't know whether you've applied before or not. They, you, uh, in the first round, as you'll hear, they don't even know your name and, and all of that kind of thing. So there is no monolithic new dramatist that is looking for a particular kind of playwright. Um, and we stress in everything we do, including the makeup of that panel, eclecticism and artistic diversity. Um, uh, and, and we'll talk more about that as we go. So that's the preamble. Uh, you want to? Sure. I'm going to go through procedure. Uh, and the changes that were made both last year and then the changes we made this year as a result of what we learned last year, and then really hope to get to that question and answer so that we can really respond to your interests and your needs and the new Play TV uh, questions that will come uh, from that audience. And we have, um, you know, as John, as Todd said, John and Eddie here to also um, be able to, to address questions of of the work here and how it happens and their own experiences. So, um, so I'm going to go through procedure. So last year we uh, went paperless for the first time, um, which was uh, quite a feat. We were able to build a custom um, uh, database through our website in order to receive these paperless uh, submissions. Um, we have a submission window, which this year is going to be July 15th to August 15th at 11.59 p.m. EST, <laughs> Eastern Standard Time. That was something we learned last year that that was not clear. Um, it's a very important, those three little letters, EST, very important. Um, so, uh, so that is the submission window this year. And... Um, Please do not wait till the last minute. Something else that, that I think was learned is that there was a rush at the end and it, it, the, the system could only accommodate so many um, applications and people got shut out. So that's an, a sort of important detail that I just want to front load right there. Um, so while that window is open, uh, Todd and I will put together the seven person committee that he referred to, which combines current resident playwrights, alums, and outside professionals. Again, the individuals who comprise the committee are, change entirely every year, and uh, their mission is to read and evaluate the work, meet three times as a group here at New Dramatists, and, uh, and then decide by consensus who the incoming writers will be. That is their basic charge. It's about a nine-month process. It's very labor intensive. It's taken very, very seriously. That's true. I think it's, it's you know it's, it's a really big job that they're asked to do, and it's taken very seriously. Um, uh, so, so that's the kind of that. So that's uh, and we do rolling communication. So we let people know where they are in the process after each meeting. So it's rolling communications around. Uh, if you are not being moved on, you will, you will know. Uh, after the meeting, so we make sure that people know where they stand and also are encouraged to reapply. Again, with the odds that Todd explained, um, it's very stark. And so many, many people, I would say the majority of the people that are in the community now have been multiple appliers in, in their time. And it can range from two times to 15 times to more. I mean, we don't really keep track of that, and it's not necessarily information that we offer to the committee because it's really irrelevant. You know, what's important is the is the is the work, the focus on the work and the way it catches hold of those committee and then how they can uh, with their own subjectivities and taste forge consensus around a group of writers. And that's really our job is to help thought, is to facilitate that consensus uh, and communicate with the committee and and guide them and shepherd them through a process by which they can then make those decisions. So uh, going back to sort of the, the what we ask for are two full-length plays, a bio or resume, your playwright bio or resume, or an artistic bio or, or resume, 
and a statement of interest. This is another significant change this year. In the past, it's been very open to a statement of interest uh, about New Dramatists, about why New Dramatists. And this year, we actually are providing a prompt question to which we are asking people to respond. Uh, New Dramatists was founded on the premise that playwrights are each other's greatest resource. So we lead with that. The question is then, how would you engage a community of playwrights, of other artists, of peer artists who are playwrights. So that is the prompt question that we're asking people to respond to in their statement of interest. Um, oh, another, this is a detail about submitting. As Todd alluded to, the first round of reading is done blindly. So no names are attached to uh, the plays. So this year we're asking for a separate uh, title page upload on which you can have your contact information and then submit separate documents. That we, your plays are submitted as separate documents. The title of your play should be on every page, but not your name, not any special thanks, not any identifying marks or tattoos <laughs> on your plays. Um, and so those, that's a new addition this year. Um, so is that clear in terms of separate title page with your contact information, plays, or PDF, or Word, is that right? Word documents, yes? Oh, he's listening. Um, separate uh, PDFs or Word documents without your names, but with your play title on every page as an identifying uh, um, item. Um, can I say something yes, about please. that while you're looking? Mm -hmm. um, so we, we made two changes last year that are um, uh, at, that were intended to um, uh, again are you know what we battle being a place where you know hundreds of people you know apply each year and we want to include everyone and we can't um, is this sense of um, insiderness, you know, and, and what we strive for is the most fair process we can. So last year we went blind with the first round so that everybody's plays get first read um, uh, without names attached and that you then get circulated into the process through that. And we did that uh, also to, uh, you know, really open up the sense that there is not just the sense, but the actual access to the, to the committee. Um, the other thing that we did was we stopped asking for recommendations. In fact, we don't accept recommendations. So that the names of the people who you know or teach you or who've been here or whatever, don't care. they've never really carried any weight, but nobody knew that. You know, they, they, nobody ever looked at the recommendations. So then the thought that you guys were having to like, spend your gratitude chips <laughs> asking you know, former professors or colleagues or whomever to write you, you know, time-consuming letters of recommendation and you were having to, you know, prostrate yourselves and they were having to spend their time just felt all wrong. And it also, I think, added to the sense of who you know will help you get into New Dramatists, which was not really the case at all. What gets you into New Dramatists as Emily mentioned is that your plays set this particular group of seven people on fire at the same time, which is really hard. <laughs> but it's also, when it happens, it's a really kind of righteous and fair thing, access point, you know, as opposed to like it's my taste or it's Emily's taste or John's taste. Um, so those are two things. I just wanted to talk about that line. So that it becomes really important, not just as a matter of policy, but actually as a matter of fairness to yourself to make sure that there's no identifying features on the plays, because then you are truly in a blind process. And so we've, we, we're at a place where we're not going to accept plays that have names on them, because you know, we're trying to be really clear about that. It's for everybody's. Exactly. Yeah. So that was it. Those were the sort of main changes. Um, were, are there any questions about that, Jacqueline? You have a question about the book, basic read the first one. That's a good question. Uh, the first one gets read, and then the second one is introduced as you advance in the process. So that's uh, a, 
that's how it works. So there, yeah. But you do upload them both. The yes. At once. Yes. Upload them both. Yeah. Everything comes in at once okay. because once the window closes, there's no way to re-access your um, profile page or anything like that. So yes, everything comes in the forefront of the process. Okay. Yep. Yes, the Patrick. Yeah, you decide which of the two plays you mm -hmm. you decide No, you do. You have the two. Um, guys are asking great questions. You, you decide which is your A play. So that would be the first play to go into circulation, and which is your B play, which is the one that follows as you advance. So you decide that. You want to lead with your strength. You want to lead with your what you're passionate about and hope that that passion ignites within that committee. It's, I, I, want to, I want to turn to Eddie for, mm -hmm. on that point for a minute, too, mm -hmm. because I think you might be able to provide some guidance. It seems to me that the hardest decision that playwrights grapple with in the process of applying to new drama is, is what plays to submit and what, what's my A play and what's my B play. You know, the ideal submission is to extraordinarily brilliant plays that would be interchangeable as A and B. We, you know, that also reflect what you're doing right now, what you care about, your voice as a writer, who you are, and that say everything you want to say about yourself as a writer. Good luck finding those two plays. But um, I don't know if you have any sort of sense of guidance about either how you think think about that or how you as a former panelist have um, thought about A and B. Well, it's a little like Sylvie's choice. It's like, which is your best play? No, I love them both. Um, there is one that you're more passionate about that comes from a truth. And maybe it's not the perfect play, but you feel very passionate about it. I would, I would put that in the day. Um, and I would also say that because the panel changes every year, if you don't get in one year, don't say, well, that play, I shouldn't submit it the next time. You will have a whole different panel the next time. So submit that, if you're really passionate about it, put that one up again, and you may get a different response. Mm -hmm. I would, I would all, you know, that makes me think of something that I don't think I've ever said before. It's almost never, in my experience, the A play that stops the panel. It's the B play. The B play is the one that's like, well, I loved that A play, but what were they thinking with the B play? Or, gosh, that's not done yet. I don't know what they're, where that's going. Or, I don't understand the disparity between the two plays. I don't know. John is in the uh, odd situation of being on staff, but before he was on staff, he was actually on the committee. And then we, we had to kick you off the kick committee because right. we hired you on the staff. Right, but I'd already read 40 plays. So, <laughs> uh, I, I was years, so I came to the first meeting and then I was rotated off of the uh, committee. But, uh, so I don't know if you have any thoughts about AB. Well, I mean, I, I agree absolutely with what Eddie was saying, because I found the plays that, that's, that excited me the most weren't necessarily the plays that were the perfect plays. They were plays that were just really startling and creative and really theatrical. And you could feel the sort of the passion and the love and the heat in the play, you know, and they just kind of engaged my sense of theatricality and my imagination. And so they weren't, again, they weren't necessarily the best play that I play in the bunch that I've been reading, but those are the plays that I, that, and particularly because, you know, you're looking at people, you're looking at playwrights, you're not looking at the play, we're not a producing organization, so we're not saying this is the play we're going to take, to. we're looking at the writer, and so there are times when you read something that's just amazing, and so that's something that's going to be really exciting, and that, that out of the panel, you're going to feel passionate about. I want to say one more thing, and then I, I know Carlos had a question, but I think, you know, I guess because we're in baseball season, I think of it as, you know, you want to lead with your strength, and then your B is your closer. I think rather than thinking that the B is maybe not as good, you want to, because if we get to the B reading, it's because somebody, there are people who really are interested in the A, and so you want to close with a strong B, because then that kind of, that could seal the deal, rather than, this is my strong play, and this one's good too, it should be a closer, not the sort of I qualify. I just wanted to add, add really quickly. If your A play moves on, everybody on the panel is rooting exactly. for your B play to be excellent. Trust yeah. me, we're all please. <laughs> okay. There's nothing more heartbreaking than you get to the B play. You're like, I was so invested in this writer. I so love this play. I wanted it to be good. Um, 
especially it's true. Eddie happens to be a very generous. Uh, uh, it, I can't tell you when he was on the panel, but when he has been on the panel, he's been very generous. And what happens is generous panelists very often say, "Oh, I really liked this A play. I want to read the B play." So they're requesting in the midst of the 140 or 150 plays that they'll read over this nine-month period or more, more. It's about that. About that. They they are sometimes requesting. They're finding people that they like and they're asking for the B play. They want to so know more. It, they want to know more, and they are doing that thing that John mentioned, which is trying to intuit you through your plays. So let's go here, Carlos, because he had a question. I'll come up here to Alan. And I've got a few questions on eligibility of plays. One is in terms of minimum and maximum length. Yeah, good question. Is there? Well, we asked for full length, and I know that's a, it, it's not an easy thing to um, to judge. But you know, what we say is that it should it wants to constitute a full evening of theater, and there are times, you know, a. a it, it has to do with the, su the substance, not just the sort of page number. I mean, a 90-minute one act is a full length, obviously. And we've had writers in the past who wrote minimally, but they were full plays that maybe came in at 60 pages. But when you read them, the experience was full and rich and deep rather than a 60-page sketch of something. You know, So you really want to lead with your substance and of content, I think. Also, uh, what about a play that's had a uh, showcase? Uh, totally eligible. Yes, I mean, we make no, um, there's no criteria around that particular matter that, you know, things that have been produced are not eligible or things that aren't produced or aren't eligible. It's, again, it's really about your, your selection to you offer to the committee to read. And the, and the panelists won't know the production history of the play, um, it's certainly in the early rounds. Later on, if, if you move to the semifinals and the finals, they have access to resumes and things like that, which they almost never ask for, but occasionally they do, because they want to look up, like, I, I feel like I've heard of this play. Wasn't this at the Humana Festival in 1963? What is this person doing now? Or didn't I just see something about this last year in the Times? Or you know, so so there's really a sense of checking those things out, but um, they don't. Other than that, and until that point, they don't know. And I would say that while we're on the subject, if you are submitting old work because it's maybe more renowned or had more productions or something, you want to also make sure that part of your docket is to have something that you're currently working. You wouldn't want to submit two 15-year-old plays right. because somebody will find out and then they'll be like, why is this, why are they submitting two 15-year-old plays? What are they up to now? The third thought was, I have a two, uh, one two-part play sort of like in Angels in America. If, if somebody was submitting Angels in America, would they submit that as one play or as two? Or how would you want that? Yeah, that's a good question. I, it's two plays. I, I, would, I think it's two plays. They are standalone experiences. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I think. Yeah. Actually, one of the people who made it in had a two part play. And oh. It was uh, the first part and then the prequel. Mm -hmm. And they were two separate plays. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they need to stand alone. And yeah, thank you. Um, but my question's been answered. Oh. I'd have to tell you, all of our plays, everybody in the room, well, it's only eight <laughs> May it be so? It's great. Yeah. Actually, I'm not sure about that because you can find an eight play in a different way than I imagined it. It's not just good. It's got to be something that grabs the people. But I wanted to ask about something that John suggested. You said that the committee isn't looking the way, looking at these plays the way a production company does. And I, my experience is that's a big problem. People at production companies will often believe, I think, this is a wonderful play, but it's not right for us. So are you saying that there's a commitment on the part of these committees you bring together to look for what they think is wonderful, not what they think is wonderful, but they would like to do or be associated with? It is. So that's a, an important point. Yeah. Do you want to respond? You know, it's, it's only about the play. Um, one of the great things of uh, new dramas, and I have a former member, it's that 
it isn't a place where you um, try to get backers or try to get a play done. So it really is about the play. I mean, you could submit something that I would sit there and scratch my head and say, I have no idea how this would be done on stage. But it's wonderful. And I would say it's not my problem how it's going to be done on stage. It's a wonderful play. And that's nice all that would matter. And the other, I mean, the other thing is that, it's, to be really clear, is that we're not a producing organization. We're a developmental organization. And so one of the things that you can do if you get in with a play that you go, how would this be produced on stage? Is we say, let's bring in some actors. Who, what collaborators would you like to have in the room? Let's see if we can just fool around here and see how, see what would happen. Do you know what I mean? So, so there's also part of it is that it, ex it would excite us to sort of figure, to to give you the the time and the space to figure out how that might happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think there, um, you know, the truth. And this goes to your to your oh, this goes to your joke about the A plays too. Um, is you know, we do have a panel of people with varied um, backgrounds and interests and tastes and perceptions. And, uh, come on, I'm just let that go. <laughs> okay, great, right, thank you. Um, uh, you know, and so one person's amazing, oh, this is an amazing find, is going to be somebody else's ho oh, hum. And that's part of what makes it an interesting process as they start to learn each other's tastes, as they start to convince each other that maybe this kind of writer really belongs in the final mix. Um, even, you know, it, it, but it's not about this play, you don't like this play, but look at the craft or look at the voice or look at the imagination or the ambition of this play. So there really is that thing of like, um, trying to figure out who the writer is, and your first piece of evidence is the A play, and your second piece is the B play, and there's the space in between them that's part of the evidence as well. I would also want to add that you should, no playwright should think, I write naturalistic plays. I know everybody wants to have on guard now, or I write comedy. No one's going to want to write a comedy. No one, I won't get into them doing this or that, or it's a romantic play. It really doesn't matter. Because everybody on the panel is so different. I mean, um, there are plays that I did not get, and someone on the panel would say, oh, it's this, this, and this. And it would make me look at it a different way. I'd say, okay, that's interesting. So don't think that the type of play you write is not in favor. Because it really does, that doesn't have any weight. It really doesn't. Mom, I have um, something actually related to that and related to your questions. Um, I've been applying for about 10 years now. Not every year, I'm just going to out myself and be like, yeah, I'm one of those people. Um, but it is kind of cool because every year you're sort of checking, you're, it's, a, it's a milestone of a sort. You're sort of checking and I'm getting nice notes from you. Um, but I, I am, I'm not quite sure how to proceed from here as a result of that. Yeah. Mainly the reason is specifically that I have started to write a lot of music, and it's not writing books for musicals, it's writing book music for mm -hmm. So it's really, I'm passionate about it. You know, it is some of the work I'm most passionate about. And I've also started to get involved in things like um, theater in communities and site specific theater. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how to express this on the page yeah. in the way that, and I'm trying different things, and we'll see. You know, this is a larger issue for these, this kind of work, and I'm not sure if you guys accept, I don't think you accept musicals, but I'm at a point where you do, because I'm at a point where, where um, I want to keep applying, and I want to keep, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering, am I doing something wrong, or is there, you know, I don't think so, I get pretty far in the process, yeah. but I just, I just bring it up because it's, you know, well, you, you want to stop if, you're, <laughs> if it's yeah, not yeah, right for you, yeah. but I do feel that this community is a great one. I, um, I'll start, I'll leave that, and I'm sure we all have things to say in response to that. A, a few things. Um, and I want to go back for a minute. I mean, we say, uh, we, we've said in different ways that everybody on the committee is, is different. One of the things that's really similar about the committee is that five of the people are writers on the committee. So, you know, and the other two tend to be, you know, a designer and an actor, or a director and a choreographer, or whatever, you know, uh, different kinds of theater professionals. Um, and so there is a kind of um, antenna and sensitivity to what the writer is, 
try and what the record is up to. We are at a moment, and we dis we've discovered this, and we're addressing it as a developmental organization as well as you as an individual playwright, where um, you know it's not that formal innovation in the theater or crossing disciplinary boundaries or anything is new, but it, uh, things are very open at this moment, and people are trying a lot of different uh, ways. We've been in the process of redesigning our space and rethinking our spaces and rethinking our way of uh, what we're raising money for to allow for things like sound design in the workshop rooms and to get away from tables and music stands when people need it and flexible seating and spaces for work that may happen in improvisational ways or other ways. Um, we have, um, so that is something that I think you share with not only other people who are applying, but other people who are here, and inevitably with people who will be on the panel. That they're looking at those problems as a problem of moment, and not simply as a problem of, gee, is she our kind of playwright, because she's not just writing the play that we can sit around and read. So I think we're all engaged in trying to figure that one out a little bit. Um, the truth is that a large percentage of our writers work in some form of, with some form of music. So that is gonna penetrate the committee as well. Um, there is, a, Emily can talk really specifically about how music becomes submitted. I think one of the issues, if you're writing your own music, is you're also going to, that music is going to be up against, you know, a music that the playwrights have set lyrics to like highly disciplined composers and maybe you are one as well but you know that that's going to be part of what people hear when they hear the five song sample or whatever they're going to hear your music your lyrics they're going to be trying to distinguish and determine what is your contribution um, and what is your voice and what is your gift in a way so I, I, I don't know it's a kind of ramble but to say um, yes, that is, uh, your work is moving that way. Yes, a lot of people's work is moving that way. Yes, that really complicates things in the application process. It was really much easier when everybody wrote the same sort of shit because then we knew what we expected of Act 2 and of a curtain line and of an, or an 11 o'clock number in a musical. And now it's much more in flux and it's really going to depend on the makeup of the committee and their um, aesthetic openness and ambition, but you're not a freak in this process. Do you know what I mean? I do, yeah. And, this moment. and I was just going to say really simply, no, you're not doing anything wrong. <laughs> that, you know, in terms, really, you're not. I think it's sort of, I think it's continuing to, to keep your work out there um, until it meets the committee that unpacks it in a way. So I think, you know, it's, it, I think Todd's exactly right that, you know, as, as the, um, the kind of stylistic, is, as style continues to expand and we are, we are continuing to learn how to support that, then those, those, that's, those are, that's your community too who then intersects with the work in a way that says to somebody who maybe is reading in a more, uh, more, more straightforward fashion, this is how this works. It goes back to Eddie's point, and then that committee goes, "Oh, you know, it's like it's like finding the key." So I would say, keep keep it keep going, and it's eventually going to meet its committee. This is what I I mean. That's is what I've seen now. I've done this eleven years, and it's a, it's it's every year it's unique to that year, but sort of moments where you know I'm sitting there going, oh, that's a comedy. If they just read it like a but that's just that's the breaks. That's their job. And or, you know, so I think that and then you see when the committee gets the work in a way that it opens up a whole universe for that writer. And so I, I think just be patient. And I also think yes, and you have been patient. I mean you've just added yourself in here. <laughs> I think, you know, the truth is we do sit through the process year after year and um, you know, we, we're not going to write those like, you know, keep trying. Emily's not going to say what she say, says. She has no prescience. We have no way of knowing before time what year, if any, you will, uh, you will uh, uh, get in. But I think, you know, we 
you know, we do hear conversations, we do know you move forward in the process, you have more than once, as you pointed out, and I think it's um, because there's so much wonderful stuff there, and so then it becomes, it becomes about patience and it becomes about stamina. Yeah. You know, how many times can you put yourself through the process? Well, it's very helpful change to not do rec letters and to do things that make it easier to apply yeah. year after year. So that's really appreciated. And just to follow up, because, um, in terms of how we're, we're, you can submit music, but what we're asking this year is for a five-track sample that speaks, that helps inform the tone and the style rather than something that has to be assessed on its own terms because some that's that's what the recommendation of the committee was this year was to it should help inform the flavor and style of the piece not not necessarily something that they have to consider on its own because sometimes that can work against the book if it's not the same if it's not the same person doing it you know what I mean the composer yeah the composer's work can influence things in either direction I think it is important, and I think we point this out on the guidelines, that generally speaking, it is hard for a musical libretto to be competitive with a play that's written as a play. It's just, uh, there's too many variables. There's so many more variables in the read. That said, there are people who have gotten in with experimental opera libretto, uh, libretti, and, and there are people who have gotten in with musicals, and there are people who have always write musicals, and there are people who have submitted books without the music. And the writing is so spectacular that it's very clear. You know, we have, uh, I, you know, even in recent years, people who also compose and write their own work. So uh, it's, I think one of the things that's good to keep in mind is that um, is it's a kind of reception theory of applying for something like this, that you kind of have to know that someone who's reading your play is going to be reading all these other plays at the same time so what are the challenges of reading your particular kind of work? And is there anything you can do to mitigate those challenges? In the way? Or to make the most of it? Hi, hi, Lucy. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak for a moment about the personal statement um, and when that comes in and I always sort of sit down and find it I write a college essay or something, and I get really nervous, and then just sounds like with the prompt now, it's a bit more focused. But. Yeah, it gives you something to respond to rather than sort of struggle over what, what you think the committee wants to hear or anything, so it gives you a very specific thing that is about the community. I mean, the, the, again, the letters of, uh, the statements of interest are... Uh, available to the committee at any time. They're always part of the material the, during the meetings. But in terms of the formal introduction of those, those statements, they arrive halfway through the third meeting. So it, because it becomes, uh, at that point, the committee has winnowed the list to, you know, maybe 13, 15, about sort of really, really strong writers. And that becomes part of something that helps leverage, inform, uh, peak interest of, or just stand alone um, part of the process. Is that, so so it's, it's sort of introduced formally very, very late once we're starting to talk individual candidates. Um, and, and they really want to hear uh, the writer's voice at that point that's in addition to the plays. So, I think that's... Good thoughts about that, Eddie? How that works? Um, I gotta be honest, the uh, letter of interest, I'm assuming everybody who applies has interest. Seriously, I mean, because it takes a little bit of your heart every time you send something out. So of course you have interest in the organization. And you just want to keep it simple. But it's, it really is your work that's going to get you in the door. That's it. So... My experience, Lucy, is that um, because of the way those are introduced later in the at the very end of the final you know, process, final meeting, they tend to um, they tend to be kind of kickers in one way or another. Most of the time, you know, what happens is we read them all out loud. 
So at the, at the time, after we've talked about all the work of all the finalists, we pass out the statement of interest, we go one at a time, somebody on the committee reads them out loud, we then say any thoughts, any questions, any information you may have, any, you know, and people respond. And they tend to respond like, hmm, pretty good. <laughs> you know, and then we move on. But sometimes they'll respond like, oh, now I understand what that person is trying to do. Or, God, oh, that person, this is the right moment in the right place. Or occasionally will be like, man, what were they thinking? You know, why would, why would you say that? Or why, um, why apply now if you feel that way? Or do you know what I mean? So it tends to be like, you're, you're, everything's in balance, and then you throw a feather on the scale, <laughs> you know? And sometimes the feather is kind of a good tickle, and sometimes the feather is like, what? You know, but, but it's, that is a terrible metaphor. So it's <laughs> uh, but so they're not, but, so, but yes, think about it, and know that the person who is reading it is going to be reading it at the moment that they're actually making a decision yeah. as a group. Yeah, it's like bring yourself into the room at that point. I think yeah. it's, and I think to what, what Eddie said, it's simple, it's not confessional, but it is personal because this is a community and that's, they want to hear you. I mean, they're intuiting you through your play, they want to hear your voice. One thing, really, really quickly, don't use the same generic letter for everyone. That, you can spot that at a hundred paces, like And then it looks just lovely. Yeah, and you again, you've got five playwrights on the panel, so they know what those generic are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Christopher Hendricks from Twitter asked if uh, there's a certain format for script submission, the preferred format, or if there's maybe like a nightmare format that you want to suggest people away from. Yeah, I guess I, maybe he can tweet the question back if he means manuscript format or computer format. We accept text files, Word files, and PDF files in terms of the extension, but I'm not sure if he means the layout in terms of what you're looking I'm at. I'm suspecting that he does. Yeah. Does, does that I, Yeah. Well, so I answered the computer side of it. Yeah. Why don't you touch the... Do you want to... The manuals are going to say something. Yeah. Um, we also may mean in terms of template, whether it's European style, structure, playwright, and yeah. Right. And yeah. maybe the dialogue is the same line, or it's offline, or it's center. There's, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say that um, it should be the normal format, which is 12 point font. I sat on another panel where you could only submit 20 pages of your script, so one guy reduced it to eight font. <laughs> <laughs> so he could get 40 pages, and we could read it with like you had magnifying glass, and it pissed off the judges. So if you want your play accepted, don't do something like that. You know, try to make it an easy read. So. I mean, the truth is that people. Um, write plays in different uh, ways, and they position them on pages in different ways. Uh, we No, there isn't a house style in terms of the centering of the name or the, you know, uh, indenting from the left or anything like that. Uh, playwrights write in different forms, but be aware that if it's a difficult, you know, uh, if it's a difficult, unpunctuated, free-form kind of style, um, that, that creates issues for a, a panel that's reading a lot of work really quickly. And often on readers. On, yeah, on, on, almost Kindles. always. Yeah, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is an ancillary question to that one, I think. Uh, to what degree, uh, in your experience, uh, has the panel really not liked a lot of stage directions or needed a lot of stage directions? Um, stage directions, I think, in the beginning of a play to set the mood and the tone and where we are, are great. Um, I think what they do, if, you, if you're reading the play, they might cut the rhythm. And what you want to do is have a rhythm while you're reading it. If every other line has a half paragraph of stage direct, I don't think you're doing yourself in favor. I don't think it, um, I've never heard anybody on the panel complain about it, but me as a reader, as someone trying to read the play, I want to get the rhythm of what the character is saying. So. Uh, a little while ago, something was said about notes or feedback. Do you actually provide that? And how far along do you have to get in the process to get that? We, we do not provide any feedback. Um, and it's, uh, and, and 
the notion of feedback in a way for us is wrapped up in confidentiality, that um, everything that happens in the panel is um, uh, confidential, including it's anonymous who's on the panel in a given year. Um, and so anything that we might say would be taken out of context. Unless, you know, unless it was like, well, one person, you know, on the third day of the meeting at 11 p.m. said this, and another person said that, we would never do that kind of thing. It would be, it would be wrong by being out of context. What Molly was referring to is that Emily and I, when we signed the letters, and it's especially true in the semifinal and final round, we often will write something that is true that will, or that simply says, you know, I'm really sorry, try again, or there was a lot of interest on the committee that we feel, I think, okay about saying, but beyond that, we won't give any specific okay. feedback about the plays and no criticism or even no, like, even like they really liked your A play, they didn't like your B play, because again, <laughs> next year it's going to be a whole different group, so we would be misguided. It's a seven-year period. Are there goals outlined for something like that in terms of what what uh, would like to be accomplished, or is it just nebulous in that respect? We uh, two years ago, so no, not organizationally, but what we started doing as a way to uh, to kick in, to, you know, this sort of proactivity of each each resident as they come in, we have started working with them to articulate and unleash their ambitions for what they want to accomplish over one year, two years, five years, seven years. That is uh, more just a statement of what those goals are so that we as a staff can help facilitate, foster, uh, support, encourage and, and witness what those things are. They're not held to them in some way. But I think what we have found, and it was based on feedback from writers, we do check-ins uh, in the second year and in the fifth year. Uh, second year because usually after their initial orientation, I think there's, they're overwhelmed and forget what is being offered to them. So we check in in the second year to kind of go over those things programmatically. Um, and make sure that they're sort of sailing into their residency uh, with full information. And then in the, the fifth year check-in is um, to sort of say, there's two more years, what haven't you done yet that you want to do? And we found with a couple of people, sometimes in the second year, but more distressingly in the fifth year, where they, uh, they, they, they were shy and didn't necessarily feel entitled to or um, empowered to ask for things. And so we thought, hmm, that's, that's curious. So how can we uh, get right in on that ground level to help support that empowerment and, that, and those goals <laughs> and those ambitions earlier on? So we started doing that as part of the orientation is to, to ask each incoming writer to articulate what that means for them. And also, I think uh, that, that process happens a little, maybe you can talk about that, with individual pieces that you may work on. Uh, right. I mean, and part of it, too, is that, I mean, in addition to uh, sometimes the writers just not being aware of what was, what was available, it was also a sense that, that part of the articulation is, is so that we could actually say, oh, well, you might want to consider doing, using this program for that, to achieve that goal. And here you have an opportunity to come here and do this, you know, uh, three times if you want to do. You, know, you could come back time and again. Um, you have a new play, you have a show where it's going. Why don't we just, you can just come in? We'll bring in some actors, bring in a director for life, or no director for life. You want to sort of uh, create that, that, that work process. Uh, but part of it is is being able to sort of say that these are all the, the opportunities that are available for you to accomplish that goal, to achieve that goal. And then, of course, part of it, too, is whatever your life is, you know, if you're teaching and you have kids and you have, you know, it's kind of like, okay, how do we actually look at the calendar in a year that actually may help you to just kind of figure out ways that you can find time to be in the building? Because that's the big thing about being in the drama, is being in the building and being available or availing yourself of all the opportunities that we have in the building with this, you know, with the staff and then uh, with the building itself. Question for Eddie. Um, during your 
seven years, what did you find was the most useful or revelatory experience? Um, actually, um, I think about musical life, written or played with dance. And I was able to have a, uh, I don't know if workshop's the right word, but yeah, I was, I was able to get uh, three dancers to come in, a choreographer, and just see how it would look. I would get to a point and say, okay, now they dance. And on paper, that's like really interesting, but okay, what happens when they actually have to dance? So that was very, very useful. I thought you were going to say me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> So that was part of, that was a new introduction last year when we went paperless, we, and there are letters of recommendation. So it's now become solely an internal process where once the application window, the admissions window is closed, we circulate the entire list of applicants to the current resident company only, and they can opt to advocate in favor of one writer to have both their A play and B play automatically uh, to go into uh, circulation automatically to two different readers. So that's not something necessarily that it should be solicited. It's really in the privacy of their own you know, relationship with that list to pick one person. For and they're the still circulated blind. Yeah, they're it still doesn't blind. change the status. or And the, the readers don't know if it's an A play or a B play even. You know what I mean? When they get the plays, it's not designated as an A or B play. I think it's important to say how that came about as a practice or as an attempt last year. So it, it used to be, historically, new dramatists, playwrights, alumni, and board members could, by recommending a playwright, ensure that that third's A and B play got read by one, at least once each, before that person was rejected. That was really the only logistical leg up in the process. When we went paperless and wanted to go recommendationless, we went to our writer community and our, our resident playwright company has through various systems of an executive committee that's all volunteer and they're, they serve on our board and they're, they're part of the, um, really the policy setting of this place. They said, yes, that's a great idea, go recommendationless but we don't want to absolutely give up our power to help someone get, be sure that they get a full read before they get eliminated in a problem, that, in a process that has some randomness in it. So we settled with them on this, where they can select one person at the beginning off the list and enable, so that's 49 of the playwrights, and that person has to have the big play circulated as well in the first round before they get in. So that was a kind of, I wouldn't even say it's a compromise, it was just what we came up with. Um, uh, and that's, that's the most influence that anyone has in the process, except those seven people. Anything else? Anything else? Anything from the world? The virtual world? Well, um, there's uh, all the information and re reiterating a lot of the things that we said in terms of what's available to the, the resident playwrights and the guidelines, information, are all on our website. But I ask, you know, despite us being committed to paperless, I do have paper if anyone wants to take it away and read it on the train. It's very, very scintillating. 
Um, so uh, we have that, but um, and you're also welcome to you know email us questions if they come up for you. It's a you know accessible. We want to make sure that it's clear and that you understand the procedure and things like that. So thank you. Thanks Thanks for coming. Thank Thank you, UKT. Good luck. Right now, submit heartily.